Hi everyone, <clears throat> my name is David Rao and I'm the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. You can also find my ideas on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, um, a variety of other places, <laughs> Instagram, I don't know. Uh, when you search for my name, David Rao or Make Moments Matter. Um, I'm excited to be uh, here today to talk to us about something just a little bit different, going a little bit off the normal script. Uh, normally I share about my K through five lessons for the week or do an intensive on one specific grade or, um, or something like that. And this week I'm gonna try something a little different and talk just a little bit about using visuals, um, using um, all sorts of different things um, that students can see um, or can interact with um, in your elementary music classroom. And I'll talk about more, more about that in just a second. Um, so, uh, if you see something in the video that you're really excited about or interested in, you're like, where can I find that? Um, I, I have a whole page on my blog, makemomentsmatter.org, with um, links to, to um, the stuff that I'm talking about. So, if you click at the link on the bottom of wherever you're watching or listening to this, um, you should be able to find a direct link. But if you can't find that, go to my blog, makemomentsmatter.org, and click on the videos tab and the 2021-2022 Musical Mondays recap, and you'll find all the stuff there. Also, there's a Facebook group if you're interested in joining another Facebook group. Um, I feel like it's a, a very fun, positive, great place to ask questions, get ideas. Um, I know some of the big groups can get a little bit stressful. I don't feel like this one is. Uh, some of those big music teacher groups can get that way. So uh, I hope that this is a fun and exciting place to learn with others. Um, search for Every Moment Matters, a music education community in um, Facebook and you should find it. Okay, and one last thing before we get going, and I'm, I promise this is the last week I'll talk about this uh, at the beginning of the, the video, but um, several weeks ago I launched a new course um, all about teaching um, ukulele in the elementary music classroom, I'm calling it Ukulele 101, um, and it has uh, tips and tricks and ideas and lesson plans and my chord progressions, like why I teach them in what way, and um, and it has a lot of the like backgroundy stuff, plus also recommendations on what kind of uke you might buy or um, what sort of accessories you're going to want for your classroom, all sorts of extra stuff. Um, and that is, if you're interested, um, you can go to courses.makemomentsmatter.org um, or again, go to the links page and you can find a link there. But um, I just wanted to share about it because I know over the last couple of years, I've done a lot of workshops, some online workshops, some in-person workshops, and a lot of people are like, I really wish I could go to that but I'm not near your location or whatever, or I can't do, you know, so this is a place, or the, the online workshops the last couple of years were uh, hosted through, you know, a small group or whatever, or they're not left online. This is like you join the course and you have it forever. So if you're interested, you can find that. It's courses.makemomentsmatter.org. Okay, cool. So visuals, what do I mean? by <laughs> So um, also, I know that some of y'all are listening to this as a podcast. So I'm going to do my best to explain any visual that I talk about. I will, tr I will try my best to remember to do that. Um, okay, so I feel like that, you know, in music, we, um, we do a lot with sound, right? Like we work a lot with sound and shaping sound and getting kids to think about different ways to express sound and how to uh, be louder or quieter or to be faster or slower, how you could change. There, there are a lot of different ways to talk about and change sound. And we do use symbols all the time. And those are things that we have to teach our elementary school students. Like we have to teach them um, some of those symbols and some of those um, shorthand things that, that show up all the time in music. That's part of our job. That's not what I'm talking about, but that's part of our job. So along the way, we're teaching some of the symbols, the crescendo, the different dynamics, the tempo markings, we're teaching all of that. And then um, I, I always think it's so hilarious when um, an administrator or a teacher leader or something talks to us about, and by us, I mean all collective elementary music teachers, about you need to integrate reading into your curriculum. And I'm like, well, I'm not teaching like, you know, a leveled reader, like I'm not doing that, but I'm using a ton of books in my classroom. But also what I'm teaching kids to do is to look for patterns and recognize similarities and differences. And I'm teaching them to not just read words, but read them in time and to look for rhymes and to look for, you know, like I'm teaching kids to like look for all sorts of things that are like all of the the core basic concepts that go into ELA, right? Like, so I always think it's hilarious when, when a classroom teacher or, or a, a teacher leader or an administrator is like, I need you to scrap your lesson on 
note reading, treble clef, this song, whatever it is you're doing, because I need you to stop and like read a physical paragraph. I think I teach all those sorts of things, but in like a different way, you know, like I'm, I'm reinforcing all that content. But anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. But anyway, um, we do a lot of visuals in our classroom anyway. And I wanted to talk about some of the ways that I've been using visuals recently, um, or I've been using things that help students understand. Because sometimes, um, you know, I've learned over the years that there are some kids who benefit from seeing me physically do something. So like, let's say we're playing a pattern on the xylophone. They benefit from seeing me physically do it. Some of them need me to put it into words. They need me to sing the song or they need me to sing the notes they're supposed to play or they need me to say the notes they're supposed to play. Some kids just need to try it out. They need to hear it and try it on their own. Some kids need a visual. And sometimes they need different kinds of visual than maybe we're ready or, ex or expect to give them. That's one of the things in the last you know 10 years I've learned as a music teacher is that the I think some of us default to like the, the visuals and the, the notation, the things that we learned in secondary um, education, like that we personally learned from. And we think like, oh, a visual is like the notes on the staff. That does not have to be the visual that's going to help students. So anyway, let's talk about some of those things along the way that can be really beneficial and really helpful. And again, getting kids to think about music, but maybe using a visual way to do that. So um, just in general, a couple of just ideas about visuals. So I think that it's really helpful to have a way to project up. So if you have a digital projector, if you have like a digital TV or something where you can make an image larger, that is beneficial. That's one of the things that like, I would, you know, let's like go to the mattresses. Isn't that a thing? Isn't that a thing that people say? Or I would, <laughs> I would go to bat for, I would fight for, um, I, I would, I would absolutely go for, for something that's like a visual, a way to present to students. And that's why I always ask for one. Like if I'm presenting a workshop, like I'd, I'd like a digital projector because so much of what we do is based around images or storytelling or, you know, whatever. And having a great visual helps with that. So if, if there's something I would fight for, it would be like, I need a projector or I need a, a TV or whatever for, for what I'm doing. Even if it's like a, um, yes, I can do lots of things without it, but it's super, super, super helpful. Along with that, um, something that would enlarge an image uh, in real time, because we can we can do a lot of things like on PowerPoint, but there's a there's a lot of a lot to be said about in real time um, manipulating an object to show students. So what I, what I mean by that, if you have like an overhead projector and then you have like a um, a document camera, right? Something that takes an image and in the moment automatically enlarges it for students to see. Um, that's super beneficial. My version of that now, because I, when I first started teaching, I had a document camera and it plugged in by physical cords to my digital projector. Now um, I have my iPad and my iPad connects through Bluetooth, through AirPlay, Bluetooth. It connects to my projector and I'm able to, like with my iPad, I can turn on the camera of my iPad and through AirPlay, through my Apple TV, I can project it up on the screen. And that is amazing. And that's something that like then if I want to read a book, if I want to write, if I want to um, take and physically move around manipulatives on my table, if I'm doing that physically, kids can see that. And so that is super duper beneficial. I know all of you are like, we get it. Okay, so, <laughs> or, or like we we know, we've seen that happen. But if you've not, you know, like it, it's beneficial to have that. Um, go fight for that. So a couple ways that I do that. If I have books, especially this last year, this year or last year, um, I always project them up on a screen to show students. Now, I know some people stress about copyright. If I physically own this book, um, I know during COVID, uh, um, publication companies, um, publishing companies have, have had more lax rules about um, showing visuals of their um, books to the point that they allow read alouds and things on, you know, virtual classrooms. Um, but if I understand copyright correctly, and I, I hope I do, if I physically own this book and I'm using it with my students, if COVID were not a thing, I could say, okay, everyone, this is a board book. I want to use this book, but it's so small. Scoot up so you could see the pictures. I can't do that during COVID. I don't want it 
on purpose make all my students smush together. So instead, what I do is I open the book underneath my basically document camera, but it's, you know, I'm using my iPad as a document camera, essentially. I put it down there and I actually have like an iPad stand that just sits and looks at my desk. Like my iPad is on this tripod thing um, and it points down at my desk and then on my desk is the book and I just flip and read. I don't believe that that violates copyright because I own the book. I am using it in class. I am not distributing it online. I'm not distributing it to an open group. I'm not, I'm only in for the purposes of this, using it to project up in my room so that my students can see the book that I already own. I don't think that violates copyright. If you're a copyright lawyer and you're like, David, let me talk to you, please let me know. But I'm pretty sure it doesn't. So especially for board books or even for small books like Mortimer, oh my gosh. It, it is so beneficial to have that visual for kids to see um, and, and to have to be able to make it bigger in the moment is great. So an another great example of why I like to do it in the moment. Um, so Mortimer is a great example. If you don't know this book, it's a super fun book. Um, uh, so in the book, it's really great for instrument exploration. And by instrument exploration, I mean like uh, pitch percussion, xylophones, metallophones, glockenspiels, because it makes a really great correlation between up and down um, and it talks about going up and down stairs and if you can see this um, the words thump 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 which there are not enough words for a full octave but I do a full octave um, that going up the stairs look like stair steps like the words thump on the page physically go up like they, they go by stair step they go up and so this is really beneficial for kids to see because that helps them connect like the idea of going up with sound um, ascending you know it's it's really important for them to to make that connection and this is a great book to use for instrument exploration another thing um, that I do with this book is I use those um, red step bells like they're they're it's basically a glockenspiel that like e it looks like a set of stair steps and each step is the next note up on the scale well that that, that pairs so well with this idea of Mortimer um, going up and downstairs, his family going up and downstairs. So with this book, it's great to project the book up, read it, talk about it, and then have kids play on those step bells. Um, whenever somebody goes up or down the stairs, they get to play that, but it helps them by having that visual up there, right? So this, I'm able to tell the story. It's really fun, but then the visual of the, the words going up and down are really, really powerful. It's also interesting in this book, um, talking about, um, I definitely stop and have a moment talking to kids about well, what I think Mortimer needs to go to the hospital because look, when he opens his mouth, these things are flying out of his mouth. And the kid's like, Mr. Rowe, what? And I was like, yeah, see, look, he opens his mouth and these, I don't know, are they bugs? What is it coming out of his mouth? And on the picture, it's music notes flying out of his mouth. And, ki and these kindergartners this last week were like, Mr. Rowe, he's okay, that's music notes. And I was like, wait, when I sing, do music notes fly out of my mouth? Is my mask full of music notes right now because I've been singing. Is my mouth, if I take my mask off, are, are notes gonna like fly everywhere? And so it's fun to help for, for kids to make that connection of like, okay, the illustrator put in these notes to tell us that someone's singing, even though we can't hear it. You know, so like that's another moment where like this visual is adding so much to the lesson because we're talking about, you know, what, when you can see that, that note on the page, it helps you understand that there's someone singing. And then a, another great comparison is a page later when his brothers and sisters are yelling at him, notes don't fly out of their mouths, stars fly out of their mouth. And I say, wait, what? but the illustrator got it wrong. Shouldn't it be like music notes coming out of their mouth? What's happening? And the kids will be like, Mr. Rao, Mr. <laughs> no, they're angry. Look at their face. You can see the stars show something different. And so it's fun to ha like have that conversation with kids and talk about that. But that wouldn't happen if they couldn't see the visual. And especially because of COVID, if there are kids in the back row, they're not gonna, this is a little tiny book. It, I mean, like it's, it's not big. So projecting it up, I think is really valuable. I like being able to do that in the moment, especially if you have that like document camera sort of situation going, you can point to the actual book on the, you know, on the table in front of you and kids can see that big, thing um, on the wall and they can see that projection. Okay, my iPad, like I said, I can mirror that image of that iPad. Um, and so because I can mirror that image, then whatever I have, um, you know, if I'm using the camera function of my iPad, whatever the camera of my iPad is looking at will show up on the big screen. But also if I have an app on, open on my device, if I 
Um, there are a couple drawing apps that I can draw. I use, I'll talk about a little bit later if I have time, but when I'm like showing kids how to make notes and rest, it's, it's great to be able to, that's like a digital document camera. Like I'm able to sh project up what the app is doing. So I could be like drawing on a whiteboard or something or on the whiteboard or on a page down on, on my table and have that projected up. But it's also nice to be able to do that digitally from the iPad to have that mirrored up through AirPlay. Um, not that like you must only have an Apple device, like do whatever, but it's nice to be able to have something that um, in the moment can make a digital image. Okay, I've also found that so many kids benefit from having an actual visual um, that that like gives them more knowledge, gives them more, um, well, that gives them more. So an example of that would be, um, you know, a couple years ago I was working with my special ed teacher in the building and she was talking about, um, she called, um, she said, oh, you use a lot of realia. And I was like, what is that? Because, you know, like in education, we're always coming up with new words that aren't really words or, we're, you know, we're changing things, you know, like different versions of stuff. And she's like, oh, realia, which is, and she was like, it means like a, a real manifestation of something in the physical world or like a, like a token, like an image. So for example, um, you know, when I'm teaching little Sally Walker, I have a little toy teacup with a saucer in it and then we can talk about what is a saucer what is it used for i can physically hold it and show them instead of just having a picture um i like having like physical objects um and so she was t this the sped teacher was talking about oh your realia is great and i was like i was so you mean like i have visuals that students can see and understand it's especially great for english language learners to have like a a token or a a, a representation of the thing you're talking about because then they can connect the word that maybe they don't know to an image or a, a something that they do and so it's really helpful so i have like little things like this like a little especially like for teacup and saucer this one was not really hard to find it was pretty easy to find um, and so this is a great one to have um, anytime i'm doing things with animals i try and have a little something version spiders are really weird you know like because when you do spider stuff it's like how do you find an image that looks like that thing, but it's not creepy. <laughs> so like, good luck finding some of those things. Um, but it's great to have those physical representations because kids need that. So an, an extension of that is um, puppets. And so because puppets can sort of embody um, that thing, you know, the puppet is there, like kids can say like, this is this is a, a chicken, right? Mm -hmm. And so like the chicken, this chicken puppet, um, you know, is, it doesn't look exactly like a chicken, but enough that kids sort of know what it is. And then the chicken can do all sorts of things. I can manipulate it. We can, you know, do a little dance. We could do some stretching or whatever. The chicken could help us teach a story. I know a song about a thing, about a chicken, you know, like the, and then the chicken really helps us. But like having this as a visual is really, really beneficial because um, it is sort of a representation of that image and then it can lead us in other places. So. Yet another reason, go buy more puppets because they are really, you know, they're beneficial but just for the sake of having that visual. Okay, let's talk also about like digital visuals. So I also like, I, I think it's super important to have, um, anytime you talk about new vocabulary, you're talking about something that's maybe um, tricky for kids. Um, I always have, I always try and have a visual of it. So let me show you an example of that. So when I'm teaching this song, Alabama Gal, let me switch over Instagram so you can see that. Um, when I'm teaching this song, Alabama Gal, I hope you can see that Instagram. Okay, um, I have a whole, you know, this is a favorite folk song set. I've talked about these before. This is a freebie in my Teachers Pay Teachers store. So if you wanted to like try it out, check it out, see if it would work for you, um, I put a link on the links page, but it's it's free in my store. So you can go and download the whole thing and see what it's all about. So um, I, the first page is just like a, you know, they walk in, what are we doing? Um, and it talks about Alabama Gal. Now this is something I thought I was gonna use as a bulletin board. So like I have all of these extra things that I thought I would use if I was gonna put it up in a bulletin board which I do that sometimes if I teach a song I might print it off and throw it out on the bulletin board but like you know which grade is it so I have K through six listed there or um, you know different names come through in a hurry you might call it or Alabama gal you might call it so I have different like um, sort of header images 
But when I'm teaching the song, things that are beneficial to me, like having a map of the United States and then showing like this song is from Tennessee. So having a pullout that shows them where Tennessee is. This is really cool too. Like if my kids, you know, if we're talking about Tennessee, but then it's like, well, where is Tennessee? Okay, well, first of all, where are we? We're in Kansas. Okay, let's find that. So having a visual like to show them, you know, Tennessee's not that far away or to talk about like, um, you know, it's pretty close to us or look how far, you know, we're te doing a song from California. Okay, well, look how far it is. Or um, if the song is like from the UK or if it's from France or if it's from India or whatever, I usually have like a world map version of what you're seeing right now so that kids can see like how far away is this song coming from or where is that country it's coming from. Um, okay, so these are just a few more things that are included, like what is a folk song, some of this information about that, so a little bit of history about the song. But like the song uses the word rock candy, and not a lot of kids know, well, kids might know what rock candy is, but having this visual there is really helpful. So if you don't have like actual rock candy at school with you, like having a visual like this is really beneficial because then you can show the kids what's up there on the screen. They can be like, oh yeah, I've seen that before, or I know what that is. And so having that visual like this is really, really cool. It's also nice to have like visuals of people actually dancing, actually singing. So here's another one. Uh, people actually sashaying through the alley sort of show sort of what that is. I also learned a couple years ago, kids can really benefit if you have a visual, especially for folk dance, like to have, to give them another way to see it. Of course, they'll see you demonstrating, right? And they'll, their partner will be there to help, but some kids really need a visual. So here's a visual of a real setup. So on one side is all circles and the other side is all squares. And so the kids can sort of see like circles are paired with squares, but they're in a long row where there's like a row of squares and a row of circles like looking at each other. Okay, that's sort of helpful. And then there's a whole visual of verse one, verse two, verse three, verse four. So on verse one, you know, the circle, the line of circles and the line of squares and the head couple, one circle, one square, go down and back. There's an arrow doing that. The next one, swing your partners, sort of a visual of like crossing paths and swinging. Verse three shows how to peel the banana, how to how the top couple peels goes outside the two rows and meets up at the bottom. And verse four, they make a they make a bridge, and everybody else comes around and up and through. So like having a visual like this for some kids is so beneficial to give them just one more look at how it works. So they have a little bit more information. Okay, another example of a visual that's really helpful. Right now, I'm teaching an Austrian that went yodeling. And so when I went to do that, I was like, well, I don't have any visuals for this. So I pulled up um, a map of the world, okay, that highlights Austria. I think I just typed in Google like Austria on world map. And this was the first thing that came up, but like, cool, exactly what I needed, right? Um, and then I have a picture of the Alps because we talk, you know, in the song, we talk about going yodeling out in the mountains. I have a picture of someone wearing lederhosen because at my school, we do this thing called International Festival where the kids are supposed to like sort of dress up like, uh, the way people would maybe traditionally dress up or what they would traditionally wear in the country where the kids are from or whatever, you know, like where their ancestors hail from. And so having this and talking about like traditional clothes versus um, current things, you know, so it's like, um, it's, it's great to have visuals like this. So then like, again, for Avalanche, my kids don't really, like maybe they know what it is, but they haven't seen it, you know, maybe in a movie or something. So having a visual like that's really helpful um, for all the different things in the story, for the grizzly bear, for the skier, for the St. Bernard, I have visuals for each one of those, for the milking maid, for the pretty girl who comes at the end. You know, I have visuals for all of that to help give them a sense of what that thing actually is, or at least place a little context. So. Visuals like this, really super helpful. Let me see if I can do um, another visual here. Um, okay, let me turn this around. So these are sort of digital means that you can use visuals. You can use projected visuals, things that are sort of gonna help kids um, as they're learning, give them a little bit more. So these are just sort of projected visuals. So like the favorite folk song set, that's a freebie. You can go check that out and see sort of what's included. That's like a great example of like all the folk song sets I've ever done, um, but it gives them a little bit more. Um, or the Austrian went yodeling. Find, if you can't bring that physical thing in, so like little Sally Walker, I have a teacup. You know, little Sally Walker sitting in a saucer. I've got that. But I can't bring a St. Bernard into my classroom as much as I would love that. That'd be hilarious. But I can have a picture of one and that's really beneficial for kids. Or I can't have an avalanche, right? But having a picture of that gives them a little bit more. So the visuals are really um, worthwhile and important um, and helpful.
So anytime I'm teaching something that has, um, anytime I have something that teach, you know, that has vocabulary that's tricky or whatever, I always try and have a visual that goes with it. Okay, so let's see. Um, we talked about realia. We talked about uh, puppets a little bit. Ooh, another example. So um, one of the cool things, and I know I've shared this before on the um, on the Musical Mondays, but I thought I would just show it one more time since we're talking about um, this sort of thing. So um, vocal explorations. There are all different kinds that you can use. Um, I have, let me see if I can pull up. Oh, what's a fun one? I'll just pull up the ocean one. So I have these um, vocal exploration slides that I've used for a long time. Um, there's a, a whole set of them I have on TPT. There's, even, there's a free one there too. Um, and one of the things you can do on your iPad is if you go into the accessibility settings. So if you have an iPad and you're able to mirror it, this is a cool thing you can do. You go to the accessibility settings and you go to the touch setting. And there's a way to basically make um, a little home button on the screen of your iPad. And that's what I've done. So let me see if I can pull this up here. So you are seeing, hold on, let me fix your Instagram so you can see it. Okay. Oh, this is working really well. <laughs> let me move this down. Sorry, Instagram. It's always tricky when I try and show a digital image because I don't, never know if it's going to quite work for y'all. Okay. Here we go. So here's... Um, Here's like the vocal exploration slide. Thanks for bearing with me, uh, Facebook. Um, so here is a little, this little dot that's moving around. This is when I go into the accessibility settings on um, on my iPad and I, I check um, under touch. I can, I can do assistive touch and that's what this is. So like right now, actually what this is, is like a little mini home button and I can give it a lot of different things that I want it to do. So like if I actually tap it, it'll take a screenshot. So let me try it. Yeah, so that's one of the, the cool things it can do. It can work as a home button. It can do all sorts of stuff. But also for me, it's like a cursor. So like when I do this now, if I if I mirror this up on my screen, kids see the cursor and they can follow me wherever I want. So if I say, like, oh, check out the whale, and I circle the whale with the little cursor, then kids can see that. It highlights it a little bit. It's especially fun for these vocal exploration slides because... You know, I could use like a laser pointer. I could use my finger. I could go up and trace it. There are all sorts of ways you can have kids follow like the glide of that, um, of that, you know, sound coming down, the image coming down. But I can also trace it on my iPad with this little cursor, this assistive touch, and kids will see that and it looks like a cursor on the screen moving. So, so kids, it's a, it's a fun way to, to connect that visual for them. And then also in the moment I can walk around the room, I'm not tied to that visual, I'm not tied to the whiteboard. I can walk around the room and because I have AirPlay going, um, I can be anywhere in the room and they can still see what's on my screen. So here's another one, you know, uh, the sea turtle's going and he can, you can follow this. So with his voice, you go, and I use vocal explorations all the time because warm-ups, I use them, um, especially for when we're learning like um, melodic direction or we're, when we're trying to make a connection between an image and sound. Um, and so these vocal explorations are really fun. The kids think they're fun. And I think, oh, wow, we're tricking them into learning again, you know, because it's uh, it's getting them to see how the connection between the visual and, and make that connection to what they hear. And so that's really cool, beneficial. Like I said, these vocal exploration slides are super fun. Um, and it's a, just another great example of how you can use that visual to benefit you. Um, you know, I also, along with the vocal exploration slides, I do things like, you know, vocal glides as warm ups. We do, you know, movement that makes that connection. I, I try and have kids um, understand that concept in lots of different ways, but the, the visual is a great way to do that too. Okay. Let's talk about using visuals like to teach um, different parts. So right now I'm teaching a song to my fifth graders um, from this book, Music for Children. Woohoo! If you've taken ORF levels, you're like, I've got that one. Maybe you have all of all of them, all of the volumes. Um, but this is a book that if you've not taken an ORF level, like a like a summer professional development course, I would maybe not recommend you getting it because it's it's something like you sort of have to unpack and understand how to use it for it to really be valuable. But there's a song in here that I'm teaching right now, and I wanted to show you sort of the process of how I'm teaching that. I'm not gonna show you the actual song, but I wanna show you just sort of how I'm doing it. So um, for example, why 
it's it's not super helpful if you don't have the training because it gives you just like a verbatim like um, here's the here's the song but it doesn't show you like here's the possibility of how you could change this here's how you could change this other thing here's how you can modify this to really show you like how to flesh out the lesson so I would say get the book and then take ORF level one it's worthwhile it's fun it'll not only illuminate this book for you but a lot of other resources too um, but anyway I just wanted to highlight like here's this book that I'm using uh, and um, because like the song well here I'll show you in just a second so like this the song example I'm going to show you um, is um, a little bit simple but you'll see why in just a second so when I'm teaching a song, I mean, you. I think that you could do a lot of things to try and teach like the melodic aspect of a song. So I'm trying to get, get kids to play um, a melody or a series of melodies or, or di learn different parts on like a xylophone, a metallophone, a glockenspiel, right? And there are a lot of ways you could do that. You could show them written notation if your students are used to that. Um, you could you know, sing the melody and have them sort of like pick it out, try and figure out how it goes. Um, you could physically go and show them. I mean, there are lots of things that you can do to try and teach them that part. And this is just sort of another way to do it. So let me see if, again, sorry, I'm going to try and flip these around uh, so that y'all can see this. Instagram, sorry, here, I'm trying to flip this around for you. Okay, so the song I'm teaching is this one that goes, unk, 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 I once was fair and young, I would not wed and so must well. Okay, the the translation from German says a hideous toad within this well. That's I just changed it to uh, go so much easier. So that's the sort of thing I'm going to teach. And the song um, has its own melody. So we learned it first as a poem, then we transferred it to to a song. We sang it, um, but that's not the one I'm going to show you because the song it's copyrighted. It's in this book. It's not my song, so I'm not going to show it to you. I'm going to show you sort of how I use this process of teaching this song's melody. But I'll show you with a song that probably you already know. Because also probably not everyone knows this song. So, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Let's assume you don't know how it goes, right? Um, so I might sing it. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. So first of all, I would you know have students like trying to figure out the form of the song. We would talk about... It doesn't just go twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky, end of song, right? Like it, something happens, what happens? We would try and identify there's the first part A, the second part B, and then we go back to A. So it's really, it's an A, B, A song, right? So we might just go through and identify that as we're going. But then, you know, if I wanted them, you know, I'd sing it, we'd sing through it a couple times. I would want them to sing it probably first. But then how would I get them to play it? Well, there are a lot of things you can do. So what I did, I did this with the song I just showed you, Unk, Unk, Unk. But the, I'm going to show you how I did it with Twinkle, Twinkle, or how I could do it with Twinkle, Twinkle. So let's say we get our instrument out, right? Um, so I would put up a visual sort of like this. Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, How I Wonder What You Are is above. Um, basically, it looks like a metallophone. Um, like if you're looking down on a metallophone um, and you're seeing all the bars except the lowest C is highlighted red. The lowest G is highlighted green. The lowest A is highlighted blue. So do is red. So is green. La is is blue. So I would put a, I would put this up there with the words twinkle, twinkle, little star. I would put the colors on there and then I would say, okay, so now, and I switch the slide. Now the C is still red. The G is still green. The A is still blue. But now all the words for twinkle, twinkle, little star are all red. So I'd say, okay, let's play um, the words for Twinkle Twinkle, but play it on the red bar on C. So it sounds something like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, how I wonder what you are. Right, so it's all on that one pitch. There's, that's why it's beneficial for them to know the song, at least know the words, right? Okay, so then once I've done that, then I would say, okay, well, what about um, Twinkle Red and then Twinkle Little Star is green? How I is red, wonder what you are is green. So again, the C is red, the G is green, okay? Uh, on the picture, on the visual of the, the metallophone. So then they can sort of go twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. It's just part of the melody, right? So we're, get, we're getting there in increments. So they would be able to play, hopefully then they'd make that jump C, C, G, 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 G by following the colors. 
red, red, green, 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 green. Well, then the next green is going to be adding in blue. Um, only now it's the top line is red, green, and blue, and the bottom line is back to black. Red, red, green, green, blue, blue, green, black, 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 black. So I maybe would have, the first couple times would have how I wonder what you are on that so, do, do, so, 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 to sort of like get them to get that interval a little bit more practice with the new rhythm. But now I've taken it out. You could do that, you could dot, it's up to you. So it's twinkle, twinkle, little star. Black, 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 black. So red, red, green, green, blue, blue, green. Again, there's the visual of um, the the xylophone with the colors on it and then the colored words. I could also do like um, icons or iconic notation with color if I wanted, if I wanted, but I'd, I'm not really interested in this specific lesson to get kids to be reading like a melodic contour, but I could do that. How I wonder what you are, how are we gonna get them to do that? Well, I would do maybe the last one, huh? red red or sorry black 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 for how i wonder what you and then r could be red so how i wonder what you are is c and then i would say like okay so twinkle twinkle little star can you take about two minutes to try and go through and figure out what the next steps would be to get you to that last word r which is red black 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 r is red Okay, see if you can figure that out. And that's when they would hopefully figure out F, F, E, E, D, D, C. Now, I could go through and do like, you know, D could be orange and E could be purple and F could be, I don't know, silver. Or what I mean, like I could go through yellow. I could go through and color code every single one. But what I'm hoping is that kids would see this, would be able to get the beginning contour from the first line right and then figure out the next part on their own again i'm showing you this with twinkle twinkle little star but the song that i'm actually teaching them is unk 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 i once was fair and young right and so then i'm um i'm using the same process of coloring the words to teach the melody for that specific song so like by the time i'm done i'm gonna have a whole phrase you know of of words unk 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 i once was fair and young in colors to sort of help them um know how to do that and i would do that with twinkle twinkle little star potentially too if i were teaching that right to kids but then just have them um figure out that second that second line and probably the whole B section and have them figure that out on their own too. That's just an idea of how you can use that visual and use color coding to sort of help you along the way. Again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to their, the bars of their instrument and like put a red sticky on C and a green sticky on G. Like I think it's, great if kids can make that connection from the visual above to like what's on their thing like maybe if a kid is really struggling i would do that but probably i'm gonna like lean into them like hey let's figure it out and let's talk through it instead of like going through and doing all of that for them because you could but there's also something to be said about like let's challenge them to do it you know or maybe they have a partner help them out or maybe they whatever but um i think that just the visual up on the board with the color-coded words is a great helper and then they can make that translation to their own specific instrument but again whatever you do in your classroom do in your classroom if you if, it, if you think it's really helpful cool okay so um that's one idea of talking like using a visual to help you teach i wanted to share another one so um ooh, before i before i leave um, this. So I I know I've shared about this before, but for years and years, I had a struggle with kids trying to figure out how to hold the mallets to play um, a xylophone, metallophone, glockenspiel, right? And I always used to say like, hold it like a bicycle. And then I found out a lot of my kids don't ride a bicycle, or if they do, they ride it in some weird way that does not translate to my classroom. And so trying to find a way to explain that visual of like, how do you hold the mallet correctly? How do you do it so that you can like play and make a good sound? Um, so I'm part of the American Orf Shulvik Association, um, which AOSA is our uh, acronym and uh, abbreviation. <laughs> AOSA for American Orf Shulvik Association. If you're a member um, and you want, there's this thing called the Digital Mentorship Program, where like as a new teacher or newer teacher or new to Orf teacher, you can be uh, paired up with a more veteran teacher, someone who's been doing it a while. And um, the cool thing is like all throughout the year, the school year, they like 
connect with you, you can share lesson ideas, you can ask them questions, you can share lesson plans and be like, hey, what would you do here? Or this thing flopped, why did it flop? Or I have a question, you know, about whatever, um, or would you help me find an ORF summer program or what, you know, like you can ask all these great questions. One of the things I asked when I did the digital mentorship program years ago, I asked my mentor, I was like, how do you get them to hold the mallet? And she was like, oh, I was telling them to think about a turtle what <laughs> so, um, she said it's it's it makes so much sense right like a turtle so here i'm a turtle puppet a turtle is identifiable because it's got a big shell right like there it has other things too it's got the legs it's got a long neck with a head on the end it's got a little tiny tail right but the biggest thing that we notice about the turtle is its shell so when you're holding the mallet you want to have that same thing you want your hand to be the shell right so like the back of your hand is the back of the shell um the part of the mallet that comes out that goes toward um the end of the mallet, where the, the ball or whatever the round part is, if depending on what kind of mallet you have, that's the neck with the head on the end, right? A little tail sticks out the other side of your hand. Your fingers are the legs if you need them, right? And so this is like, it becomes a visual. And then with my kids, um, you know, if their hand is turned over upside down or whatever I say, you know, we talk about why you don't want to put a turtle on its back and or on its side, it'd be so uncomfortable, blah, blah, blah. Um, Anyway, so then they understand that visual of a turtle, that visual in their head, it makes complete sense somehow. And if I ever have kids who are holding the mallet incorrectly or doing something weird, I will go over with my mallet puppet, or my mallet puppet, my turtle puppet, and I won't even say anything to them. I'll just show them the turtle, and I'll have it like laying on its back, and then I'll turn it over. And the kid who's holding the mallet upside down, you know, with the, with the, the back of their hand towards the floor, they'll they'll whoop, they'll flip it because they understand that visual of the turtle and how their hand makes that connect. So like this again, this one little visual has made such an impact in my classroom. And I don't even have to say anything anymore. I just go over and hold the turtle and I turn it over and the kid goes, Oh, whoops. Ooh, and another thing. So I tell this ridiculous, crazy story about um it's not true at all. About, oh, I had this one girl who came and said, Hello, little turtle, how are you doing today? and then pushed it, used her index finger to push its head down towards the floor. Oh, it's so mean. I don't know why she pushed its head in the sand. It's, it's, oh, but poor turtle. And I said, oh my gosh, what are you doing? She said, oh, I'm sorry, is this not the right way to pet a turtle? And I was like, no. Um, and then she went to her instrument, and she took her mallet, and she held it. She had a long neck with a head on the end. She had a little tiny tail, right? She had um, a shell for the turtle. She great. And then she took her pointer finger, and she pushed down on the mallet, which was pushing down on the neck of the turtle, and she pushed it into the sand again. Oh, no. And I told her, don't do that. It hurts the turtle. So wrap your uh, your index finger around the turtle's neck to give it a, just a little hug. Right? This is, again, a, like earth-shattering moment for my classroom because then kids, when they put their index finger on the mallet, it generally they will press down into the bar and dampen the sound. And so having them wrap that finger around. Some people say like wiggly worm fingers, but that visual has never made sense to kids. And like, like I said, I've tried using it, it just does not work. But telling them like, oh, the turtle, don't push on its neck. They get that, right? Because they already have the idea in their head of the turtle, right? And so like pushing down on its neck is a no-no. And so we talk about that. So anyway, it's another visual that like, bam, it just makes so much sense. Don't know why, but they totally get it. Okay, let's talk about one more visual thing that's um, uh, helpful, hopefully, before um, I go. Okay, so I have for years used um, used cards when I teach form. So like, let's say I'm teaching Twinkle Twinkle again. I, like that's something I just shared about. So I have these cards um, that it's like a half of a sheet of letter size paper. Um, and on one says A, and it's a big block letter A with a red circle behind it. And then I've got another one that says B. That's again, a big block sort of letter um, half of a sheet of paper with but this time not a circle behind it, a square behind it, and not a red square, it's a blue square. So I've got um, A with a red circle, B with a blue square. I've also got C with a yellow triangle. If I wanted to, I could go on and do, if I've got a here, did I bring it home? Apparently not. Okay, hold on. I've got to have the other cards in here. I don't know, D is like a orange 
hexagon or something. I don't know. I don't know how did I how did I lose those cards? Anyway, I have like A B C D E F whatever. So if you're if you're teaching form, it's great to have these cards that you can then like put up. I have magnets on the back of mine so they can stick right onto my whiteboard. But if I'm putting you know like twinkle twinkle little star, okay, twinkle twinkle little star. How I wonder what you are is the A. So I would put that up, boom, on the whiteboard, and then up above the world so high like a diamond in the sky is B. So I would stick that up next right okay just smack myself in the eye with that card uh anyway so and then in the last part comes back um twinkle twinkle little star i put up another a so i have a b a and again the visual is really helpful this is a, i mean twinkle twinkle is, a, is an example that is silly right but like with more complicated songs or with folk songs or with anything else having that visual up there to show them the form and to map it out as you go is really beneficial for them or if you're teaching a thing and you're like, well, we want to create a form. Okay, the, the singing part we, that we did, the song, that's the A. Okay, now we're going to add um, an improvisation section or we're going to add movement or we're going to add whatever. Let's call that B. Or if it's contrasting, you know, if it's uh, another A. Okay, let's do it again. Let's put another A up there. So having these form cards has been life-changing because I use them all the time for all sorts of stuff um, and it helps kids see that visual. Oh my gosh, here's D and E. Okay, so D is a it's hard to tell a purple diamond and e is a orange pentagon whatever just another another um shape with a different color to sort of help kids again see the contrast between a and b and c so not just seeing letters they're also seeing the contrast between colors they're seeing the contrast between shapes these are free they're on my teachers pay teacher store um, i linked them um, on the links page but another version let's say um, this last week, or in, in the coming weeks, actually, I'm going to teach um, a book, um, which I'll try and maybe share about this on another day, but I'm teaching a book called Dim Sum for Everyone. Um, and one of the things that we're adding to that, this is sort of a silly example, because the cards that I have at home are Thanksgiving-themed food words, but I have food word cards at school that are just sort of random foods. Um, but I'm teaching this book called Dim Sum for Everyone. And one of the things about dim sum, if you've never eaten dim sum or been to a dim sum restaurant, is like you get little pieces of things. You can like take things as they come and make, make choices. And you so it's sort of fun because it's like um, you get different, different foods, all different kinds of foods. You can choose what you want. You get to decide how it goes together. So the connection for me is that I have these different food card, food word cards. Um, and on the cards are uh, foods plus uh, a picture plus the rhythm that goes with them. So like mushroom is ta, ta. And there's a little picture of a mushroom, right? Okay, so macaroni, ta di, ta di, or t, 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 if that's what you say. And then a little picture of a little macaroni. Okay, uh, peas, ta, rest. Picture of peas, the notation is there. Um, Turkey. Okay, again, this is like Thanksgiving slash fall themed food words. Coffee, right? So what my kids are going to do is like once we've read the book Dim Sum for Everyone, we're going to talk about different foods. We could talk about even if you're not at a dim sum restaurant, have you ever done that before? You've been in a place where maybe there's like a buffet or something and you take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this. You know, you can put things together and find out how you like how they go together, right? Or maybe um, you're at... Um, I don't know, a, a restaurant with a buffet. Ooh, and you don't want to load up all in the popcorn shrimp, even though that is very tempting. You want a little bit of popcorn shrimp, and then you want a little bit of this other thing, and a little bit of this other thing, and a little, taking little tiny pieces, right? So what I would have kids do with the bag of foods is I say, take out like maybe four foods that you think are fun or you think you might like, or maybe would go together, uh, maybe wouldn't go together. I don't know, it's up to you. You get to decide. So my kids would come up, um, with four or five different things. Um, and then I would say, okay, I want you to decide which of those is your number one favorite, uh, the first thing that you would eat, right? Or the one that you would always want to come back to. Okay, and they so like maybe they choose. So let's say that I've got... Okay, again, this is so weird because these are food words. Um, but let's say... Let's say macaroni. And I can't eat gluten free. Okay, hold on. Um, <laughs> turkey. Okay, that's going to be my number one. Turkey. That's going to be my first thing. Okay, and then let's see a second thing. What's my second thing that I would want to do? Okay, I'm going to. Mm, um, okay, turkey. I want to say coffee, but I don't want another ta ta word. So <laughs> let me do uh, cranberries. Okay, turkey, 
cranberries. Let me do um, one more um, corn. Okay, so those are my three. So I've got these down in front of me. Turkey, cranberries, corn. Three little cards. Each one has the word, a picture, and the rhythm that goes with it. Okay, so my first, my A is turkey. That's the first thing I would eat. B is cranberries because healthy fruit. Okay, third is corn. Okay, because again, corn. I'm a Midwesterner. I can't not like corn. Okay, so what I'm going to do is maybe I give kids... Um, a whiteboard or maybe they'd be in a small group or whatever and I would put this up on the board and it's just a, another half sheet of um, just letter paper I did I made these at school on like PowerPoint in like three minutes but it just says a B a B okay so what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your a food word and your B food word and you have to make this pattern so write it out on your whiteboard so I would write turkey cranberries turkey cranberries and maybe I would have them write out the notation too. Ta, 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 di, ta, 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 di. Cool. Okay, that's one little meal, one little plate from your dim sum that comes by. You're going to grab it. That's going to be one of your little plates. Okay. All right, let's see. Now I need you to make um, A, A, B, A. I'm going to have turkey, turkey, cranberries, turkey. And again, depending on what my objective, maybe my objective is having the write out rhythm patterns, maybe it's reading rhythm patterns, maybe it's reading and playing on a hand drum, whatever. I can modify this to do however I want. I could have them write out that whole thing. I could just have them have their cards in front of them and just in the moment have to try and figure out A, A, B, A. What does that look like with my cards? A, A, B, A. And having the cards physically in front of them is going to make that process easier. Maybe it's, you know, like I just said, okay, you're going to write it out and that's going to be your first little plate. That's gonna be your first little meal. And so you've written out that thing. Maybe then you take, you know, take other foods or whatever and you know do a different thing. But these cards are just elemental forms. So A A A B, A B B A, A B C A, A A B C. It's all these little elemental forms that those patterns that come back over and over again in all sorts of things, um, in songs, in poems, in um, all kinds of music. So these are just things that I'm going to slap up on the board. They, they all have magnets on the back, right? And these magnets, by the way, I did not buy these magnets. If you peel part of this off, I know I've shared this before, but these are like the little calendars that, that um, you know, like football teams and banks and credit unions and whatever give away for free, right? They have like maybe on the other side, it has like the credit union information or calendar or the, the schedule for the football team or whatever. These are the little reminder things so at the end of a end of a calendar year people throw these away because they're no longer valid or maybe they stay in your refrigerator for like 18 years i don't know but i ask uh people who work at credit unions and banks like hey do you have any leftover of those freebie calendars and so i have like a huge stack of these but they're perfect to slap on the back of a visual i want to put on the whiteboard um so i can just whoosh, you know magnet it right up but I have all of these, you know, A, A, B, A, A, B, A, B, um, A, B, C, A, all these different versions of this. And so then kids, we have an infinite number of things to do with the food words. Maybe halfway through I say, you know, you're probably getting so sick of turkey and cranberries and corn. Can you choose a new A, B, and C? You know, or maybe they use an element, maybe one kid chooses the form and the other kid puts them in order and then they say it together. I don't know. There are like a thousand things you can do, but the visual there is so helpful what I would probably do the first time I did it was I would probably show them picking out, you know, I would use my document camera, my iPad document camera, to show them that process of me picking out my three cards, turkey, cranberries, corn. Okay, and I would probably even, in the moment, I would say like, you know, I would choose coffee, but I already have a one that sounds like turkey, coffee. Oh, that would make a really boring thing. Plus also turkey and coffee doesn't seem to go together, but turkey and cranberries, they go together great. You know, I might like talk through that process of what I'm choosing and why. Um, and then I would show them like, okay, elemental form is gonna be A, A, B, C. All right, so then I go to turkey, turkey, cranberries, corn. Ooh, that's a fun little meal, you know? And it's all driven by this book, Dim Sum for Everyone, which is all about little plates, right? Um, or little, putting things together in a different way. Because maybe you take one bite of this and then one bite of this and one bite of this. So it's like taking this idea of dim sum, which then I'm exposing my kids to what that's like. I have a little video queued up online of kids eating dim sum, which is hilarious. Um, to sort of show them the, the cultural context of dim sum. And then we take that idea of little pieces of food and put them together 
using elemental forms, using these visuals, using all that to help us along in the process. Also, my ELA teachers and my language teachers are really happy that I have, again, foods, like food vocabulary with pictures of what it is. And and they even like the, the rhythm notation on it because they think that they're like, oh, you're helping them identify syllables. I'm like, well, yes, but also we're <laughs> interfacing with the rhythms and the note values, which is also super beneficial. Okay, so I hope this has given you some ideas for how you might use visuals or using them a little bit better in your classroom. If you're listening to this as a podcast, I hope I have helped to sort of explain some of the visuals. Or if not, I hope you can reference back this video and sort of see what it is I'm talking about because um, I know a whole, if you're listening to a podcast, a whole thing of where I'm showing visuals is not very helpful, but um, I hope this gave you some ideas and things along the way. Like I said, if you want the visual, like the form cards, they're free. They're on my TPT. If you want that Alabama gal, it's free. It's on my Teachers Pay Teachers. If you want the vocal exploration card, the sea, the ocean one that I just used, it's free. It's on the links page. So uh, go and check it out if you want some of those freebies. If there's something else you're interested in that I have not listed, um, send me a message. Like these food cards are not, um, they're not free, but they're on my they're on my links page. I'll make sure they're on there. I'll put the dim sum for everyone book if you're interested. Um, but if there's something else that I've missed send me an email and I'll, I'll send you a link to where you can find it or where you can learn more, um, give you some of those things too. Okay, if you have questions, comments, thoughts, send them to me. Ooh, also I uh, mentioned at the beginning of the, the video that there's that new course online if you want it um, called Ukulele 101 and it's at your own pace. You have If you uh, enroll in the course, you get it for forever. It doesn't go away in like a month. It's like it's there for you if you want it. Um, send me an email if you have questions about that too. But otherwise, um, I hope I see you next week. Um, so everyone have a great week with your students and have a great week. Bye everyone.